Under the ice, a lot of hot water is flowing. This is how Dor Gold, the Director General of Israel's Foreign Ministry, describes the regime's relations with Arab dictatorships. The regime's top intelligence official, too, has had only words of praise for the Saudi dictatorship, who he sees as being proactive in doing Israel's bidding by standing up to Iran, especially since the nuclear deal, which has so angered both Israel and Arab dictatorships. The once secret relations between both sides are now the world's worst kept secret, kept behind a thin veil only because the pro-Palestine, pro-Muslim unity Arab peoples do not side with their dictators on this issue. In this edition of the debate, we ask, in whose interests really are this alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia? For this edition of the debate, we have our guest, Mr. Jihad Morakadeh, who is joining us live from the Lebanese capital, Beirut. He is a Middle East expert. Mr. Morakadeh, thanks very much for joining us for this edition of the debate. Um, I want to ask you, how do you feel about this top Israeli intelligence official praising Saudis for leading some Arab states into this confrontational stance against Iran? <coughs> This is um, not re the, the real issue. Uh, the real issue is the Saudi plan, which uh, was, by the way, in 2002 at the Beirut summit, accepted by all the Arab countries, and more specifically by Mr. Yasser Arafat at the time, and President Bashar al-Assad of Syria. So it was a unanimous decision, including the Palestinians, to offer peace to Israel. Uh, I am delighted so to speak, that uh, the new efforts of Saudi Arabia to uh, 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 reach a pacific settlement of the Palestinian issue with Israel, with two states for two people, which was called for way back in 2002, uh, I'm delighted if this uh, uh, reaches a positive conclusion. So yes, uh, I'm glad that Saudi Arabia is finding a way to find uh, peace for the Palestinians. Okay, so Mr. Morakai, that's certainly an interesting way to look at this, but um, considering the fact that the Islamic Republic of Iran has come up um, as to why it is that Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia, as well as the other Arab dictatorships, are having these relations, uh, do you believe that the Islamic Republic is a threat to Saudi Arabia? Uh, it is not important what I believe. It is important what... Uh, Saudi Arabia and the GCC countries believe. Uh, Saudi Arabia and GCC countries uh, believe that Iran is a threat. It is a threat in Bahrain, it is a threat in Yemen, a threat in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq. Uh, uh, they see uh, Iran everywhere against uh, Sunni uh, interest, I would say. So uh, uh, I do not see Saudi Arabia uh, or GCC armies fighting outside of Yemen. I do not see them fighting in Syria. I do not see them fighting in Iraq. Yet the Iranians have armies and have their regular army both in Iraq and, and Syria. And they have Hezbollah in Lebanon. So obviously from their point of view, and I'm not taking sides here, I'm just saying from their point of view as an analyst, I can understand that they see Iran as a threat. Okay, but it's interesting, is it not, Mr. Morakada, because, you know, when Dor Gold, the Director General of Israel's Foreign Ministry, spoke as well about this dialogue that is underway with Arab countries, such as Saudi Arabia, um, uh, this, this official, this Israeli official, spoke about Saudi Arabia as well as other countries telling Israel very directly that they are worried about public opinion within their own countries and how the public within their countries would feel about any such relations. So though you've spoken about this as a positive thing for Palestinians, clearly the Arab people do not agree. How do you feel about that? Uh, no, it is not that the Arab people do not agree. Uh, it is a totally different thing. Uh, this is why all the negotiations are secret for now, because if the, those negotiations reach a Palestinian state, then it will be possible to talk openly about them. If those negotiations not reach uh, a two-state for two-people solution, then they cannot uh, be seen as being close to a country which is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, anti-Palestinian, or a government rather, that is very much anti-Palestinian. This is why the negotiations are secret, and they hope, and the Palestinians also hope, 
that Saudi Arabia will get uh, to a two-state solution through their 2002, which is not there, which is the Arab League proposal of 2002. Okay, but Mr. Morikade, certainly you can appreciate that there are people who will be suspicious of everyone's intentions here vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian cause. Uh, many people will say that this is Saudi Arabia as well as the other Persian Gulf kingdoms essentially selling out the Palestinian cause. Uh, if you reach two states for two people, how are you selling out? Saudi Arabia and all the Arab League states way back in 2002, accepted the idea to recognize Israel if Israel withdrew from the territories it occupied in 1967. That was a proposal, and they would establish diplomatic relationship with Israel. Now, if the Palestinians get their state, why should I be uh, 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 concerned about that? But, but Mr. Murkada, with respect, um, do you believe that the likes of the Saudis have, have stood by Palestinian resistance, Palestinian calls for, for the occupation to end, for the aggression to end? Do you think that the Saudis have really um, shown that they stand with the Palestinians in that case? In any case, uh, the point of the matter is that they are negotiating secretly with Israel to reach this particular point. If they succeed, as a Palestinian, I cannot be concerned about it. I will be happy if I have my own state through Saudi efforts. What they have done in the past or yesterday or the day before is not particularly relevant. What is relevant is that they came up with, they came up with this initiative in 2002 that the whole Arab League accepted. So if we get somewhere, why should anybody uh, be worried about that? Okay, Mr. Morikade, I wanted to go back to the, the issue of Iran once again because um, these public announcements, these more public announcements, if I may use that word instead, um, on the part of Israeli officials, especially when they spoke about um, any relations or any talks with the Saudis or other countries in the region, um, became more prominent uh, ever since the nuclear deal happened um, because Israel and, of course, the Saudis were quite angry about that nuclear deal. Why? It, wh what exactly about the nuclear deal angered the Saudis more, Israel is quite obvious. It's a very important question. Uh, during, uh, when Iran signed the nuclear deal with uh, the P5 plus one, uh, Saudi Arabia was very concerned because Saudi Arabia saw Iran, or at least perceived Iran, I say that as an analyst and not as a uh, taking party with one side or the other. Uh, Saudi Arabia perceived Iran as being a threat both in Iraq and in Syria. Already, before the signing of the nuclear deal on 14 July 2015. Uh, so I would like to draw your attention that uh, when Saudi Arabia felt uh, threatened, they considered then uh, that uh, 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 to face Iran, the only other enemy of Iran in the region is Israel. On the other side, that cannot be close to Israel, even though a lot of GCC countries already have a relationship with Israel. You have flights between Tel Aviv and Abu Dhabi. Uh, you have a commercial representation in Qatar and so on. So Saudi Arabia felt that uh, uh, in order to counter Iran in the region or to counter the Iranian th perceived Iranian threat in the region, they would need the help of Israel. Okay, let me introduce our other guests joining us for this edition of the debate. We're also joined by former U.S. Marine, Mr. Ken O'Keefe, who is joining us live now from London. Mr. O'Keefe, thanks very much for joining us uh, here on Press TV's The Debate. Um, Mr. O'Keefe, we've been speaking with Mr. Morikade about uh, this um, Israeli official who came out and praised the Saudis for um, their stance against Iran, essentially. I'm wondering, um, is Iran really a threat, A, to the Saudis, and B, will this further the Palestinian cause by holding negotiations behind the scenes towards uh, what we may call a two-state solution? Well, with regard to the two-state solution, the fact that every Western leader, left, right, doesn't matter, supports a so-called two-state solution should tell everybody around the world if this is beneficial to the Palestinians or not. The two-state solution is a disaster. It's worse than the original Nakba. Going back to uh, the Saudi uh, Israeli relationship, uh, there really is no uh, demarcation between these two entities. They both serve the agenda of this farcical war on terror. 
The Saudis are the ones who are financing ISIS and Al-Qaeda before it. This is really more of a rebranding of Al-Qaeda turned it into ISIS. The fact that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other Gulf states are supporting financially, literally funding this, is indisputable. The fact that Israel and Saudi Arabia work together tells you that ISIS more realistically stands for Israeli secret intelligence services. The agenda of ISIS does nothing but exacerbate the already draconian laws that exist in the West. It is an intended, uh, prop, it is an intended agenda of taking more uh, rights away from the people, instilling more uh, power into these corrupt governments in the West, which are never-endingly fals falsifying information in order to justify one war, one boogeyman after another. So the Israeli-Saudi relationship could hardly be any more intimate. These two are in bed and have been in bed for a long time. Okay, so Mr. O'Keefe, let's stick with this uh, two-state solution issue, if, if we may. Um, and Mr. Morkada had earlier, when I was speaking to him, had said that um, this may work out, according to Mr. Morkada at least, and according to what he felt the Saudis may feel, um, that this will work out in the benefit of the Palestinian peoples because they're, uh, quote-unquote, negotiating behind the scenes for some sort of a resolution. Do you think that the Saudis and or the Israelis, in this case, of course, can be trusted? Well, I think it's beyond absurd to think that, that the, Saudi Arabian, the, the Saudi Arabian regime, uh, the only nation in the world named after a family, by the way, the Saudi Arabian regime builds hospitals in Israel. It funds ISIS, which is the agenda, which is the instrument to maintain and continue the farcical war on terror. The Saudi Arabian uh, regime could have been helping the Palestinians. Hell, they could be rebuilding Gaza. They could have been using their influence to open the border between Gaza and Egypt. And yet the Saudi Arabian regime sits there doing nothing but funding this Wahhabi talk fury uh, insanity, this false Islam throughout the region. Everything that's happening in the Middle East right now in terms of the bloodshed is a part of the Israeli agenda of greater Israel. If we read Oded Yanan's strategy for Israel in the 1980s, we find that the agenda for Israel was target number one to take out Saddam Hussein, done, and also to balkanize, effectively balkanize the Middle East region. Saudi Arabia is feeding, is literally paying for that balkanization policy. We see that playing out in Syria, it's all too clear. We see that agenda playing out in Iraq, again, all too clear. Saudi Arabia pretends to be an Islamic regime while it sits there and destroys holy sites, including sites of the Prophet himself, it's doing this all the while pretending to be an Islamic uh, nation. It is nothing but a stooge for the West. It is the instrument of finance for this madness we see in the region. So anything that finished? the Saudi Arabian regime does finished? and the Israeli regime does is not helpful Saudi to bashing? the Palestinians. I mean, this is totally incredible. Go ahead, Mr. Morikar there. No, no, I mean, you know what? Uh, if you're, uh, you have, you have, lost, you have lost the plot altogether, Mr. O'Keefe. We are talking about the Palestinian people. We are talking about the solution for the Palestinian people. And you have gone on about Saudi bashing. Can you keep your Saudi bashing for another day, please, and come back to the question and to the issue? The issue is for the Palestinian. You mentioned the fact that the two-state solution for the Palestinians is totally ridiculous. Can you explain to me why? Because as far as the Palestinians are concerned, they agree to a two-state solution. Why don't you agree? Are you more Palestinian than the Palestinians? Okay, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. The Palestinians have every right to decide for themselves, and I have every right to voice my opinion. I am an honorary Palestinian citizen, by the way, so I do reckon I have the right to express myself honestly. The fact that every single Western leader supports a two-state solution should tell you something. If you want to be in agreement with every single Western leader with regard to the so-called two-state solution, go ahead. But how about the, the Palestinians Here's what's going to happen. Here, here's what's, here's what's going to happen if there is a so-called two-state solution. What you'll have is this powerful Israeli state sitting next to this disempowered, impotent, military non-existent. It won't have the rights to be able to exercise freedom of travel. It'll have an absolutely <clears> economically <throat> inferior state and it will always be just one false flag attack away from being pummeled by Israel. And, and the Palestinians will never get their land back. They will never have the right of return if they sign on the dotted line and say they agree to a two-state deal. So I hope to God 
that they never make that choice. But of course, it is their choice. Mr. O'Keefe, I, I respect your opinion, Mr. O'Keefe. I respect your opinion. But how about that of the Palestinians? How about that of Yasser Arafat, who agreed the two-state solution in the 2002 summit in Beirut? How about that of Bashar al-Assad in 2002? They all agreed to the two-state solution. You are telling me now, okay, that Yasser Arafat and Bashar al-Assad are, uh, 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 are not for the Palestinian people? Go ahead, Mr. I don't agree opinion. with the either of them. Other I do, I do opinion. not agree. I do not agree with either one of them on that what subject, and I certainly don't agree with all of the Western leaders who agree with a two-state solution. I've just played out the scenario for you. If the Palestinians agree to a two-state so-called solution, you'll have a, a militarily, economically, politically impotent Palestinian state next to this behemoth of Israel, and it will be one false flag attack from being pummeled. Israel is the master of false flag attacks. It will use false flags to justify pummeling this Palestinian state if it's ever created. And never mind the refugees, the 1948 refugees. Fine. I want justice what? for what? all of them. I okay. want all of the what Palestinians choice, to be able to return sir? to Palestine proper. Palestine proper, not what the two-state proper. Not 1967. 1948 is the, is the Palestine that I'm waiting for. Okay, fine. How do you achieve 1948? Don't give up, Palestinians. Don't give up. Stay the course. Stay the course. Come together. Get, okay. get beyond your differences. The, you know your enemy. Heaven. You know your enemy is funding your differences. You know your enemy is, is, is doing everything it can to get your own brothers and sisters to collaborate with Israel. Come together. Get beyond this. Get beyond Mr. your politicians who are not do representing you know your will. Do you know how many generations have gone past? Do you know how many generations have gone past since 1948? It's been 70 years, well, this, sir. 70 years. This generation what did they achieve nothing. This generation doesn't have the right to sell away the future of the future Palestinians. The Palestinians who are not yet vo voting, those Palestinians who are not yet born, have a right to 1948 Palestine. The refugees have a right to return back to Palestine. And this monstrosity you, that was created sir, in 1948 needs to be abolished. Do you have any idea where the Palestinians are today? With your ideas, do you know, do you have any idea where the Palestinians are today? I they already told Lebanon, you, they it, are is, Kuwait, it is they the are choice. In Saudi Arabia, they are all over the world. Thank you very much it for is, your ideas. Is. Okay, gentlemen, it, it I do apologize for having to interrupt both of you. Unfortunately, time has gotten the best of us, but of course, uh, we do appreciate both of your contributions to this edition of the debate. That was Mr. Ken O'Keefe, former U.S. Marine, who had been speaking to us live from London, and we were also joined by Mr. Jihad Morakadeh, who was speaking to us live from Beirut, and he is a Middle East expert. And of course, viewers, we appreciate you watching us as well. Until next time, good night.